Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer with, for and from St Catherine's on a day when the sun is shining very brightly off the kitchen floor and up into my face. But there we go. Uh, as noted yesterday, the sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. We're looking at the story of Paul and Paul is just about to get going and get on with what became the rest of his life's work. In yesterday's daily prayer, when referring to Paul as something as a multi-tool, I made the point that as a Roman citizen, he could walk into the governorial mansion in any provincial city in the ancient world. And as a former disciple of Gamaliel, he could walk into any Jewish synagogue and be invited to preach. Both of those things happen in today's reading. Join me for that shortly, but to begin with, join me in our opening prayer. And on to our reading. I'm pleased to say that I've managed to resolve the sunlight problem, so I can see what I'm doing just for a change. At the beginning of this passage, uh, there is a list of names. I've thought of cutting the list of names out, but actually it gives us a little bit of an insight as to the, the incredible multiracial aspect of early Christianity. Uh, there's a man called Simon uh, who was called Niger. I wonder if he was black. With a name like that, very likely that it was a man from Cyrene. That's in North Africa, so it was a it was a very international thing. The early church, or at least anywhere near Paul, it certainly was. Here we go, Acts chapter thirteen. Now, in the church at Antioch, uh, there were prophets and teachers: Barnabas, who we've heard of, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius from Cyrene, Manaen, a member of the court of Herod, the ruler, and Saul. Well, his name is Paul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John also to assist them. That's John who wrote... John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Just a little detail to add to that. And they also had John to assist them. When they'd gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, who summoned Barnabas and Paul and wanted to hear the word of God. But the magician, Elimas, but that is the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now listen, the hand of the Lord is against you and you will be blind for a while, unable to see the sun. Immediately, a mist and darkness came over him, and he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Pergia in Pamphylia, which is in sort of southern Turkey. Uh, John, however, John Mark, that is, uh, left them behind and returned to Jerusalem. But they went from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. This is confusing because there's lots of Antiochs all named after the, the Greek emperor Antiochus Epiphanes. This is a different Antioch than one they set off from. They came to Antioch, Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up and began with a gesture and spoke. At this point, I've cut out Paul's sermon. You can read it in Acts chapter 13 if you'd like to. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people urged them to speak about these things again the next Sabbath. When the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who spoke to them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath... Almost the whole city 
gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Can't help feeling there's a bit of an exaggeration there. Probably all the Jews in the city. But anyway, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and blaspheming. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, we are now turning to the Gentiles. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord. And as many as had been destined for eternal life became believers. Thus the word of the Lord spread throughout the region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their region. So they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's ministry gets started and underway. What we see in this particular passage pretty much establishes a pattern which is going to roll around again and again and again and again from town to town, from village to village, from country to country, right through to the end of his life. At this stage, Paul is, I would guess, mid to late 20s. So he's still young and he's still energetic. And his Roman citizenship opens the door to the proconsul's house and he can go in there and speak to the main man of the island of Cyprus. And his status as a former disciple of Gamaliel opens up the synagogue doors and as we see Paul is invited to teach. What then happens is I think really really important and this cycles again throughout is Paul gets a mixed response. There are some people who love what they hear and there are some people who hate what they hear and Characteristically, in the story that we've just had, uh, that causes the people who hated what they've heard to turn against Paul, to stir up trouble against him, to stir up a persecution against him, such that he's only been there for two weeks, not even been there for two weeks, and he's got to leave the town because he's persona non grata. That's going to happen again and again. But this division, this, this splitting of people into two groups, is something that Paul does. Now classically this is presented in the story as the Gentiles love the message and the Jews hate it. The Gentiles respond to the gospel open-heartedly and the Jews resist the gospel and fight against it. Now that may be in a sense literally true but it's really not helpful because it leads to an anti-Semitism but it also as well as leading to anti-Semitism gives us Christians a tendency to be a bit smug. So let's define this differently. The religious people, the people who are established in a religious tradition and a tradition of worship and morality are the ones who struggle to accept the gospel message. The people who don't have a religious tradition, the people who are in a sense secular, are lapping it up and loving it. And I see no reason why that same dynamic actually wouldn't be true in our society today if we were proclaiming the gospel with the same clarity that Paul did. Generally, we don't proclaim the gospel of Jesus. We proclaim, we sell uh, the, the, the religion of Christianity. But Jesus' message isn't religion. Jesus' message is about the freely available love of God and the call to love. And my hunch is that if we proclaim the message of Jesus, as Jesus proclaimed it, as Paul proclaimed it, that we would similarly find that the religious people would resist it, say, ooh, you can't do that, you can't have that. Sh quick, shut up, get out, we don't want you. But the people outside of the church, the people who are secular, would say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, I like that. I hope and pray that we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus like that.
time to turn our thoughts and our prayers and our reflections towards the prayer of Jesus and sum it up in that. Paul was somebody who was prepared to do whatever it took to do what he believed was true, even when what he believed actually was somewhat misinformed at the beginning of his story. He had that passion and God used that passion greatly. Jesus, like Paul, was somebody who was prepared to stand up and say what he thought was right, whether or not the people around him were going to agree with him. Well, we know what happened to him. So as we pray this prayer, it raises to us the question, are we prepared to stand up for what we believe is right, regardless of who might take offence to it? Not an easy question, but if God's kingdom is going to come, God's truth has got to be spoken. Join me in the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that brings us to the end of daily prayer for today. I started bathed in bright sunlight so I could hardly see and now it's raining which reminds me that when Jesus said the sun shines on the righteous on the righteous his very next sentence was and the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous or it is in fact on the, the evil and the good so I still don't know which I am I've had sun and I've had rain and I'm still who I am but Paul leads the way Paul sets us an example of being a bit more energetic about our faith. Well, we're going to get that reminder several times in the coming months. And perhaps we each need to consider, could I be a little bit more proactive than I currently am? I'll leave that for you. Join me in the prayer of the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us all forevermore.